Well, hey there, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jay Akunzo. I am the host, the writer, and the uh, one of the directors behind the upcoming documentary series with Help Scout Against the Grain. And you are here because we're going to do an exclusive behind the scenes. We're going to talk to this handsome gentleman right here, Nick Francis, CEO and co-founder of Help Scout. Um, we're going to get into why we're building this together. Why would Help Scout invest in such a thing? What is the bigger purpose behind this for the community that we aim to serve? And what's the change we're hoping to inspire? In the business world and around the planet, um, and uh, and we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty of making this too, uh, and then we'll debut episode one. You're going to get an exclusive live look together with us uh, of episode one. And, hey everybody, thank you for. And on the back end, you will also get some Q and A. So please, in the chat, wherever you are, if you're in the live studio with us, you might be in the Facebook group. Thank you for joining that group. Um, leave a chat. And we'll make sure that we get to it uh, on the back end. We have Jorge behind the scenes helping us produce this. So thanks, Jorge. I want to talk briefly before I talk to Nick about this idea underpinning all of this. Uh, it's called Goodhart's Law. Nick, you and I really haven't talked much about Goodhart's Law. But as soon as we made this, I thought to myself, this is actually the problem. So Goodhart's Law, uh, Goodhart was a, a British economist. And he came up with this idea. I don't know where we get our, our ideas printed into business law. But he's like one of those guys who did. Goodhart's Law is this notion that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So for example, growth is a measure. It's not actually the goal. The goal is to serve people. The goal is to help the customer. The goal is to help your team thrive. The goal is to make something that makes a difference, whether you create content, a business, anything you create. But when we conflate the two, when your measure becomes a goal, it incentivizes the gaming of systems. It incentivizes at all cost behavior, very destructive types of what we deem, especially in American culture, as success. This high growth, late stage, winner take all, I'm going to get mine now, I don't care what else happens around me type of attitude. So Goodhart's law is that we're conflating the measure with the goal, and that leads to some really dangerous behavior. So Nick, I don't know if you have any thoughts on Goodhart's Law. That's something I discovered after we started making this project. I just see it absolutely everywhere. Um, but uh, let's welcome in Nick here. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you won't be surprised to know that I, I think that's a great principle. Um, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, I just feel deeply connected to this notion that consumers do business with, business with certain companies, not only because they make great products, but all through, also through a, a sen shared sense of values, right? They want to know how the product is made. They want to know who makes that product. They want to know why they make it. And most importantly, they want to know this company's mission to do good in the world. And we're seeing that more and more from different companies uh, today. And a lot of these companies wouldn't really exist if not for an authentic desire to put their customers at the center of their business and their mission. Uh, so, you know, the reason I got so excited about, about partnering with you and the team on this series is to tell stories about these businesses and the impact that they're having. Yeah. I remember when we first spoke, we talked a lot about how there wasn't necessary, necessarily any clarity around the questions that we had. We had a lot of questions. And so in my experience making shows, so this was my first documentary series of this nature, but something like my, my 12th branded show I was trying to big, bring to pilot. And I think I've done six to a successful season one. And I'm hoping this one goes well beyond. Um, but I remember saying like one of the best ways we can construct this is to say to ourselves, something about the status quo is broken. We see a mountain peak in the distance that we'd like to endeavor towards. And we'd like to invite more people to come along this journey. And the show is like this in real time or in near time hacking through the forest as we try to reach the mountain peak. So it's more about like the questions we have than handing out answers. Uh, and it just so happens that the format of the show really speaks to that too. It's a travel-esque type show built obviously before the pandemic. And of course, here's where I need to say the obligatory, I hope everyone is doing all right and continues to be all right. Um, but around that idea, Nick, of like big questions we're trying to answer, as an entrepreneur, as the CEO of Help Scout, what are the questions on your mind, whether you're thinking about your own business or you're looking around the business world that you, you desperately want us to try and answer through this documentary series and the community we're building around it? I remember the, the most fundamental question that we started with was, how do these businesses survive? Mm. And, and not just survive, but how do they thrive? They build this extraordinary business where 
on paper, if you asked an MBA for their adv advice and they looked at the business like a spreadsheet, they'd say, oh, well, this, this bank that's been around for 100 years should get squashed by Bank of America when they, when they come into town or whatever. Uh, this coffee company, there's a million coffee companies, Starbucks. It, how, how does Starbucks not just kind of crush this little coffee company in Saratoga Springs, right? There's, there's something about like how do these businesses who are surrounded by competition, who are surrounded by companies, multi-billion dollar companies that are far better resourced, uh, how do these companies not just survive, but they create this genuine connection with their customers and they thrive. They build an extraordinary business. And I ask that question for selfish reasons. We're very much on that journey ourselves at HelpScale. So uh, it's a it's a visceral question. Uh, you know, I think we even started by saying uh, this wouldn't work well for the for the series theme. But how are these companies not dead? <laughs> yeah, you, like, right. these, these companies shouldn't exist. There's there's even you see right. a mention or two of that line. Um, we did we shot some promos in a diner uh, in Massachusetts. Me and the production team. And there's a couple of promos that um, people can find scattered on the internet where we say that line because it's like the classic understanding of succeeding in business, the classic story that we think is so problematic and we're trying to redefine and tear down a little bit, it, they don't have that, right? And then I remember you said to me something that I'll never forget. They're like, you said, yes, but they have something you can't cut a check for, you can't purchase, which is this really deep customer connection. Uh, and so now we're trying to unpack why, how does that form? You know, how do you actually execute on values? Um, and, and this thing, I wanna be clear with everyone watching, it's not something we're inventing. Right, like Nick, you and I see this all the time. It's bubbling in different pockets, whether it's Eric Reese of Lean Startup fame and the long-term stock exchange, whether it's a podcast like Zigzag from TED, which is trying to make business more human, uh, whether it's private companies that are that are looking for ways to execute on their values. This is not something that we're like we're owning it. We're the only ones, and this is ours. We're saying this is bubbling, and it's great that it's bubbling. How do we turn it up to a boil? Yeah, yeah. We, we just wanted to be part of the conversation. I mean, as an entrepreneur, uh, I, I'm fiercely motivated to help write the playbook. What is the what is the next generation of entrepreneurs? What are they going to be inspired by? What companies are really going to inspire their way of acting and their way of existing in the market? Are they going to exist to serve customers? Are they going to exist to be on the cover of Forbes and be celebrated in American culture for a growth at all costs mindset? Uh, we really want to offer a different playbook to our entrepreneurs that feel this genuine connection to their customers. And that's why they founded the company. It's part of their DNA. They exist not only to build a great business, however, they choose to define that, but also to serve customers and their community in a significant way. And that, that's something that that's sort of lost in, uh, in some of these companies today. It's like, where's the commitment to the community and actually leaving the world better than you found it? Uh, and the three companies that we worked with on this series, that is so clear how, how vastly they are investing in their community. Yeah, it, it was a privilege to go and visit these businesses because I, you know, not only, like I said, that I have a lot of questions, you're going to see some of those play out in episode one in a moment. Um, but the stories are incredible. I mean, like when you talk to people about what they're passionate about and they're not passionate about maximizing profits, right, or optimization of everything they do for efficiency's sake, they're passionate about like using business as what it could be used for, I think, which is this high leverage vehicle. I mean, you can do a lot and affect a lot of change, negative or positive, by building a for-profit entity. And how do you use that as a leverage for the most good, right? For people that you work with, partners, communities of people, the globe, right? The environment. So um, it was interesting to hear them talk about, like, why are you doing this in the first place? Um, not all of them said, I got into this to change the world. Some of them said, I, I just found my way forward because of my personal experience with hair care products and now this and now that. And now I find myself in this position to affect positive change. It's almost like a fork in the road that a lot of people building businesses or working for businesses reach where they can decide, am I going to go get mine at all costs, right? Is this a selfish endeavor or am I going to try and actually live out my values? And obviously the earlier you make that decision, the better. So it was a privilege to talk about and talk to these, these individuals and teams. Um, my question to you, Nick, is about, you know, let's talk about Help Scout really briefly. You as the leader of the organization and your team, um, because I know you're incredibly transparent and collaborative, recently decided to register and become what's known as a B Corp. Not everybody watching is going to understand what that is. I've been blown away since I learned about what these businesses are. 
Can you just give us a brief bit of backstory about that choice you made, what B Corps are, and how it helps you execute on your values? Yeah, so there's a company called B Lab that does some really great work, uh, and they invented this concept of a B Corp certification. So uh, the way I describe it is, is just starting with the legal framework, right? So you actually become a public benefit corporation rather than what's known as a C Corp. And the difference between a public benefit corporation and a C Corp are the fiduciaries. So you have three fiduciaries. Uh, you only have one fiduciary in a C Corp, which is shareholders. You have three fiduciaries in a, in a public benefit corporation, your shareholders, uh, your, the beneficiaries of your public benefit, uh, and your employees. Okay. Right? Can you explain those a little bit? Yeah. And, and so you basically want to make decisions across all three axes and that's instead of only existing for shareholder value, right? You, you want, uh, to make decisions in your business across how is this going to impact my community? How is this going to impact my employees and my customer base? How is this going to Im impact the community that I serve in addition to the shareholders, right? Uh, I'm a shareholder at Help Scout. That's very important to me. But at the same time, there's other factors that should be considered. And it, and it really comes back to this operating principle that profit and purpose are not mutually exclusive. And so when B Lab started the, the B Corp certification, not only did you have to become a public benefit corporation, but you had to meet rigorous standards of how you're investing in your community, in the environment, and uh, and your business through all sorts of various things. So it took about, a, it was about a one year process mm -hmm. for us to develop all of this uh, documentation, for us to go through uh, the whole process to even get certified. There's teeth to this. We're all accountable as a company to be a good corporate citizen in a number of different ways, not only just to our customers, but to our employees and our community. Uh, so we, we came up with a bunch of really great programs as a result of going through this certification process. And ultimately, it just means profit and purpose are, are both important to us. And we exist in a way that we, we hope to leave the world better than we found it uh, when Help Scout is kind of done, which I hope goes well beyond my lifetime. But it's just a different way of thinking about the, a business and being successful and investing in, in the, the people and the communities around you. And, and in my opinion, I think this represents, this is one of many things that sort of represents what I'm referring to as next generation capitalism, right? right? This is, these are the companies companies want to buy from, you know, Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's, I think were two of the first few B Corps uh, yeah. to be certified. And, and you can, anyone that does business with these companies does so not only because they love the products, but it's based on a sense of shared values. Right. And that has become such an important thing to consumers that I think companies, whether they like it or not, are going to have to adjust if they want, uh, if they want to appeal to consumers and build really high success businesses. That's one of the benefits of, you know, products or software or really a lot of things that businesses are selling today being somewhat commoditized. Help Scout makes customer service software. Pretty much all customer service software does a lot of the same stuff, but because we have this commitment to other values that small businesses around the world resonate with, that's really how we differentiate. It's right. not only the things that we build, but it's our mission uh, to do good in the world that, that's super important. The, the skeptic is going to say, well, greenwashing, you know, uh, people putting up hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, because it's part of the zeitgeist, part of the thing. And, you know, there's different ways to slice that you can say, well, actually, the fact that people are uh, doing these performative things is a precursor to real change, right? Because there are some who are early adopters and innovators and pushing forward based on values. And when I say early adopters, I mean of this movement um, that business can be used as a force for good um, or of this philosophy. And, and so maybe the lagging indicator is, or sorry, leading indicator that something big is on the horizon is when people feel pressure to talk about it, right? You can look under the hood and say, you're all about uh, Pride Month. You're all about Black Lives Matter. You're all, but you're not really, you're just saying it, you know? And to that I say, mm -hmm. yes, we need to be careful um, because we don't want to be coerced or tricked. But at the same time, perhaps the conversation happens before the change. And, and maybe that's important. And so it's hard to parse. And so what we're, the reason I bring this up, Nick, is because I want to I wanna tread lightly as someone who is is kind of like raising my hand and say, well, I'll, I'll go into the field and tell these stories. Like I'll be the guide into this, you know, on behalf of Help Scout. Because 
there's a lot of things where I could just fall flat on my face and mess up or ask the wrong question where you don't profile the right story. So, you know, I th- how, how do we make sure, and this is a genuine question I have for the community too, in the chat, leave us questions on Twitter, send us ideas for companies we should profile, people we should talk to. But Nick, how are you thinking about ensuring that we're responsible about all of this? I have some thoughts, but I'd, I'd love if you could share some of yours too. Well, that's one of the reasons why we decided to take on this year long process that uh, ended last February when we got our certification to, to go through B Corp certification because there's real teeth to it, yeah. right? Uh, they look at your cap table and employee ownership. They look at uh, programs that you put in place uh, for your employees sure. through profit sharing or option programs. They look at how you're contributing back to the environment. We are carbon net negative as a company. Uh, we, for every new customer, we plant a tree. <laughs> Uh, there are real programs that, that you're held accountable to yeah. in order to validate that you are giving back to your environment, you're giving back to your community, and you're giving back to your employees in healthy and sustainable ways. And so there need to be more of these frameworks and structures for companies to say, you know what, saying something's not just enough, I'm willing to do the work, or I'm willing to be held accountable. So the more structures we have here, like the B Corp certification, there should be several others out there. I know Eric Reese and the Long-Term Stock Exchange, I'm a huge fan of what they're doing there. That's also a a way to take a company public, but actually have teeth to being a good corporate citizen, right? There's accountability and transparency required. So uh, I ultimately do think in in a world in which pretty much every company is operating to some extent as a remote company, uh, it's transparency is one of the cornerstones of operating as a remote company, which we've been doing for more than a decade. And so it's about sort of being transparent with, with how you're going about this, this level, holding yourselves accountable, right. being a good corporate citizen, but it's also participating in some of these other structures that's really helpful. Right. I think about maybe that, that, that answered my question, the word accountability. You know, I think of it as a storyteller. I'm not building a software company, right? So I'm an external hire that you made for this project. My business is, is to teach people how to make shows for their businesses, but also make shows. That's, that's what I do. Um, and so as a storyteller, as a creator, as someone who likes to make stuff, you know, the accountability that I'm, I'm trying to put forth out into the world is basically to say, I made a thing. Hold me accountable as a storyteller. Hold us accountable. Like, does this jive with the way you see the world? Have we missed a beat? Um, the criticism and the friction can actually be useful and productive. When people are forced to consume, or, or sorry, forced to ship their work for others to consume, you're kind of saying, you know, here's this one golden moment where I'm like about to ship this out into the world, which we are on the cusp of right now. And it's really proud to, I'm really proud to do that. I'm really happy about what this is, but now it's no longer ours. Right? The moment we hit play, it's no longer ours. It's up for interpretation. And that, that's sort of this existential crisis you always go through as a maker of anything. And so yeah. when you create like a belief driven show content or anything, I actually think it's, there's helpful forms of friction. You know, as a marketer, you don't think about friction. You want to reduce friction, make sure they can find what they're looking for. Yes, that's true. But there's like a filter system we're creating, which is some people will believe deeply in the message of this show. Some people will not. And what we're hoping to do is find this tipping point where more people believe it than not. And I think to do that, we have to reclaim what success in business looks like from the late stage, high growth at any cost, quicker, more, 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 mine, mine, mine type narrative. Um, so it's, I do feel vulnerable in this moment because we're on the cusp of playing episode one for a bunch of people. And then next week, August 18th, we debut it publicly. Um, so it could be yeah. a little So thank you for coming to my therapy session, everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Nick, let's, let's visit this one point quickly, then go to the premiere. Um, what was the pro what did you think the process would be like to get to us going out into the field to shoot the prep process, the planning process, and what was it actually like? Uh, there you are, Jay. Uh, I, I, I knew it was going to be really hard, uh, but at the same time, cause we, I, you and I are both friends with the folks over at Wistia who have made some incredible shows. We know what they put into making great quality video content for people. And so I was under no assumption this was going to be easy. And that's precisely why I was so attracted to it. And I felt like being able to, I love podcasts. I love all sorts of different ways of sharing content with people. But I found that 
in order to tell these stories in an authentic way, in order to give the audience this visceral connection with a company's values and why they exist and, and hopefully inspire sort of at least one company, right? Like if we can inspire one entrepreneur to go out and do their thing and build a company around these sorts of values, then this show will have been successful. And I feel like video is just the best medium through which we can tell those stories. So we were under no, uh, you know, I knew this was gonna be really difficult. I, pro I knew it was gonna take probably more than a year. I knew we were gonna suck at certain things. As you said, there were a lot of questions we had, not a lot of answers going in. I knew it was going to be an adventure, but an incredible learning experience for us. And uh, ultimately something that would become, if we, if we succeeded on any level, something that would become kind of, as you referred to, bigger than us, right? right? It's right. not unlike creating a company culture where you have this idea, you know, when, when my co-founders and I started this company 10 years ago, there's this idea for the kind of culture that you want to create. And there's this incredible learning process that, that takes place. And then if, if you, if you get it right, it sort of becomes a monster. It becomes something way beyond yourself. Right. And our cultures become this beautiful monster, so to speak, <laughs> uh, because it's become so much greater than us. They've taken these kind of core principles and ideas and made them so much greater. And so, our goal going in was, you know, we're not going to make the perfect show in the first uh, try, but we're going to put ourselves out there and we're going to try to create some content that it solicits a response, yeah. uh, a reaction, and hopefully inspires at least one entrepreneur to go out and live their dream and build a company of their dreams and, and see what happens. And so, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't be more excited to kind of put this out in the world and, and see what kind of monster it becomes. Right. Uh, I love the, the monster analogy because you need the good monsters. You need the friendly allies to battle the bad monsters. Yeah. Right? You can't you can't just send in something that's going to get stepped on and squashed really easily. And that's why I'm such a believer in story, because there's different permutations of story. You can talk about a narrative. What you're about to see is a story of one company, one idea, you know, one group of people. There are also the stories playing out in our minds, which I think that's that's the narrative I'm most interested in in the business context. That's the one I want to change. If we're trying to make something that makes a difference, the difference is between somebody who's starting a company or leading a company or contributing to a company thinking, I want to be like, insert hate for profit media or social media company here, or I want to be like Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's or my own version of these companies or Help Scout or, you know, these other businesses that we're profiling in the doc. Right, the ability to have this internal dialogue with yourself and say, actually, what's jiving with my belief system is not the typical very damaging business success story, right? And so for us to tell those stories to me is a first step in us changing the story. And But we're gonna need allies, we're gonna need partners, we're gonna need contrib contributions big and small from everybody. So like I said, questions in the chat today, happy to answer anything about the movement, the production of this, anything. Um, please contribute your questions, same on social media, but even more so flag companies, celebrate people and teams, um, if there are partners out there, like we keep mentioning long-term stock exchange, right? They're on the kind of sidelines viewing the industry like we are with this doc. You know, it's interesting because Help Scout is contributing to the industry as a company and then building something that observes the industry um, on the sidelines. LTSC is definitely doing that too. So th the, the analogy I kept using at the beginning of this was the mountain peak we see and now we're hacking through the jungle. Really what we're saying to you all is we want you to pick up your machetes and start hacking away with us. Um, what we don't want is everyone to watch this show, feel really inspired, and then go back to work and nothing changes. That's that's not success for us. This is about making a, a thing that makes a difference. All right, I think, I, I think I've gotten out all of my passion and energy there. Um, Jorge, why don't you tee up the backup links? So for people watching at home, a couple housekeeping items ahead of the premiere. Number one, there will be a recording of this whole experience. Uh, if you want to receive that, subscribe at helpscout.com slash ATG. We'll send around the recording. Number two, Jorge is dropping into all the chats a backup link. If something breaks down when we play the premiere, we don't want you to miss out. You can view it separately. So we are going to give it to you through this experience now. But in, in the event something goes wrong or you miss it, you'll have a link at the ready. Um, I think we're ready to roll episode one. Nick, are you, are you feeling ready? I'm ready, man. Fingers okay. crossed. All right. So without further ado, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We'll be back on the other side of it to talk about this episode, the production of it, the marketing of it, and answer your questions. But uh, we're going to roll episode one of Against the Grain featuring 
Death Witch Coffee. Coffee. Jorge, please take us out over the wire. Let's do this. The path to building a high-growth, winner-take-all company is well-worn and celebrated by many. But some entrepreneurs have a different goal in mind. What drives them forward is a fierce devotion to customer, craft, and community. A purpose behind the profit. A mission behind the metrics. For these businesses, something amazing happens. They thrive in the face of competition, connect with customers through shared values, and ultimately become wildly successful. I'm Jay Akonzo, and we're going to tell their incredible stories. This is Against the Grain. Something surprising is happening in Saratoga Springs, New York. Located four hours north of Manhattan, the town is home to a company with a bold claim. They make the world's strongest coffee. That company is Death Wish Coffee. Death Wish Coffee. <laughs> Whoa. Warning is this is the world's strongest coffee. High, high uh, caffeine content. When I tell you these beans are perfect. Smells wonderful. Death Wish Coffee. Cheers. Holy that is cow. like. I can feel it. I'm making it through my bag. Dang, that is. That's dark, huh? This is good. I think I'm going to be drinking this all the time now. It's easy to assume a brand like Death Wish started in LA or Brooklyn, but what's become a global movement all started here, inside a tiny coffee shop called Saratoga Coffee Traders. What is it about a company that creates a connection with customers? What takes somebody from satisfied buyer to, well, this? This is CJ Mann. He's a longtime state trooper, father to fifth grader Kira, and the world's biggest fan of the world's strongest coffee. How did this happen? Because you walk in with the (laughs) Death Wish hockey jersey, I've seen you on their podcast. I've seen yeah. you. you don't work for the company. No. You have a, you a, a, another generation. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh another yeah. Another generation of a crazy. Um, it, again, crazy it man. it comes back. It comes back to what I was saying before, which is realistically, like, it's a family. You feel like you're a part of it. When CJ's not on duty as a state trooper, he's manning the Death Wish Coffee community Facebook page, which is entirely run by fans. Once a year, he also volunteers at the Run Dead, their charity run for the Special Olympics. I've talked to every walk of life through this company. And I've done it through my job, but especially through the community and through the way this company is, has made their community around them. And it's amazing how, how better educated I am. Yeah. Not only about coffee, you know, I've learned a lot about, about coffee <laughs> through this, but I've learned a lot about people. It's not a 150, 200 people person company, right? You know, it's still a small company with a big name and a big heart. Go all in on what you love. I've said it before, death is inevitable. Spoiler alert. Jeff Ayers is a comic book nerd, an electric violinist, and the in-house, on-air personality for Death Wish Coffee. He hosts their podcast, Fueled by Deathcast, and their video series, Fueled by Death Show. And if you think that's laying on the theme of death and YOLO a little thick, you should see their office. But for all the aggressive imagery and the snarky memes, the team at Death Wish believes in something kinda endearing. You get one life. Might as well go after your passion. Aggressively. We're all fueled by this idea that we want to leave this world a little different before we inevitably leave it for good. And that's exactly what Death Wish Coffee is trying to do. We want to fuel whatever it is you're getting out of bed in the day to, to start that day for. We want to fuel you to do that. I think if you're going to do something, you might as well do it to the best of your ability, you know? And a friend of mine, Jim Cochran, taught me this early on. Uh, he's like, if you're going to be something, might be the best in the world at it. Death Wish Coffee was created by this guy, Mike Brown. In 2012, it was just a side project that he sold online. For years, his day job was running Saratoga Coffee Traders uh, straight into the ground. I didn't know how to run a business at that point. 
and I, and I ran it so horribly. I learned every lesson the hard way. Death Wish, the product, helped save the coffee shop and then became Death Wish Coffee Company, an independent e-commerce brand. Today, Death Wish is about 40 people and they sell two types of coffee, mugs, hats, t-shirts, and more. You're trying to be the best at not just coffee, it feels like. Like, it feels like you're building a lifestyle brand. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I feel like it has kind of grown into that. That wasn't the ideation at the beginning. The beginning was I was just making a product I thought was cool that I thought my customers would love. And at the end of the day, that's what fuels all of our passion. Because what is exciting about working at a company like this is that everybody's passionate about the company. We are such a knit community as, as Death Wish Coffee that everybody who works here, even when you first walk through the door on that first day, you feel like you're part of something and then only grow. Taya Torelli started working for Mike at the old coffee shop back when she was in high school. Today, she's the head of marketing strategy for Death Wish. What's the secret sauce when you think about marketing that like makes Death Wish defensible as a business, as a brand? I think it's coming up with a list, a very clear cut list of our priorities. And, you know, of course there are things like um, return on investment, impact, you know, all of those kinds of things. But at the top there, it's customer. We're not asking ourselves, all right, how can we get, how can we incentivize people to share this more? It's how can we make content or make products that people want to tell their friends about? In 2015, Deathwish entered a fan voting competition run by the tech company Intuit. The grand prize was a free Super Bowl ad. In the end, Deathwish won, beating 15,000 other companies. And sure, the exposure was great. But it was a lot more than that. You know, we had companies that were five times, 10 times, 20 times bigger than we were, um, but we just had this incredible, rabid community that they were just so willing to, to, to take time out of their day. You know, they were setting alarms on their phones. Taya has since hired an entire team dedicated solely to serving their community like content manager Shannon Sweeney. She's seen some pretty rare displays of passion from customers. Um, so we have fans who see something, whether it's design or our logos, and they literally get it tattooed on their body, which is really cool. <laughs> so it proves like a lifelong commitment to our brand. People don't want to feel like they're being sold something. They don't want to feel like they're being advertised to. So coming from a story aspect, it gives them that value that they're looking for and introduces them to the brand without forcing it down their throats. And I think sometimes a lot of brands post on social with like, buy now or get this today or um, you'll never believe this. Like things like that, that I think people kind of see through now. So telling a story just builds a deeper connection. One of the company's more recent projects is Odin Force, an original comic book series created by Deathwish purely to connect with fans. To bring the Death Wish project to life, they partnered with writers and illustrators who'd worked on Green Lantern, Spider-Man, and Batman. There's no mention of coffee. There's no Death Wish, there's no hidden Death Wish coffee anywhere or anything else. And uh, we're able to just give people a cool piece of comic book. Can you look anybody in the eye and say, these comics sold that much coffee? You know... Yeah, I no, probably not probably not a number, but I definitely can look somebody in the eye and say these com of really loving hard the things that you love. The team at Deathwish heeds their own advice. You get one life, so pursue your passion. So while they absolutely put the customer first, they still bring their full selves to their work. And good things happen. Things like this. In the summer of 2017, the world's strongest coffee became the galaxy's strongest coffee. It all started when Jeff and his former co-host, Dustin Alexander, interviewed astronaut Nicole Stott. How, how, I, do, we, how do we get Death Wish to space? How do we... <laughs> you know what? Let's talk about that. I think people okay. would love it. Awesome. So. Co-host and I were like, well, 
what would it take to get Death Wish on the International Space Station? Just, just throw away lime. Just to yeah. just because uh -huh. I want I want that. I want that sound bite, you know? And what goes through your mind if she's like, I actually think it's a great idea, we should talk? I still don't think it's real. <laughs> right now, talking to you, I don't think it's real. Death Wish is building a customer centric company. And yeah, that helps them sell a lot of coffee. But more crucially, it earns them passionate support, both online and, as I learned, around their local community. Just after launching their local business, Albany Distilling Company saw the love that people had for Death Wish, and so they asked about creating a coffee vodka in collaboration. And I presented the idea to Mike and John, and they were just like, no way. Coffee spirits never taste the way that they, sh they're not great, sorry. But Rick and his team were just as passionate as any Death Wish customer would be, so they dedicated precious resources to getting the vodka just right. After weeks of tinkering, they decided to make their own Death Wish cold brew, which finally got the flavor right. The coffee brand agreed to a partnership, and Death Wish Coffee Vodka was born. Skull and crossbones on a liquor bottle, not that easy to do, so, you know, probably four or five rejections through the federal government for, for label and, and formula approval, but eventually we got it done, and we launched the vodka pretty much right at the time that they won the Super Bowl commercial. The two companies have been pillars of the upstate New York economy ever since. It is bold, it is strong, it's got a ton of flavor, and it's got a little burn, but I mean, it's 80 proof, so what are you going to do? All right. So I think, I think we need to try some. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm not usually Cheers. a vodka drinker, but for you, my dear viewer, I'll do anything for the shot. Oh, man, that's bad. I mean, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's good. And because it's good, it's bad. Yep. <laughs> Just doing this all for you, my friend. We're having no fun at all. It's, uh, it's dangerous. It's, it really is. <laughs> they could have been that company that has all the resources in the world and pushed everyone aside, but they don't see it that way. They still see themselves as a small business that wants to work with any other local business in the area. Um, and I think that, that speaks to just them as, as people um, and what they're trying to do here in the local community. It's, it's not just trying to make money. It's not trying to, to, to sell coffee. Like, they are actually trying to grow a community around them. There are a lot of products that we could be selling that would probably make us a ton of money. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're trying to make sure that community that we've built mm -hmm. trusts us. And so I think that the, the trust that we've built with our customers is more important than any money that we'll make from them. For like a family member, like you don't want to disappoint them. Um, so I've created like really close bonds with some of these people just because of that. And it's always top of mind because I'm like, these people genuinely care about us as a company. They care about us as people, so we should return the favor for sure. Do whatever you need to do to make sure the customer always leaves saying something good about us. Even if they had a disappointing experience somehow, make sure when you get off the phone with them, that they say something good about us to whoever they talk to next. Sometimes it's buying them a new coffee machine. Sometimes it's buying them a bag of their own, maybe the, a, a different brand that they prefer. Maybe they didn't like ours for some reason. You know, my customer service team has the green light to do just about anything to make sure the customer leaves happy. I think from the outside looking in, Death Wish Coffee should not exist. They have massive competitors who can outspend them at every turn. And yet, the company is thriving, they're growing, and people love them. And I think that last part is why they're so successful, why they can exist today. It's because they have something you can't cut a check for and can't just purchase, no matter how much money you have. They have genuine and deep customer connection. You know, and wouldn't it be nice if that's how business success actually looked? It's not whatever will sell, it's whatever is right for the customer. And I know there's more companies out there just like Death Wish that believes that, we believe that, and we're on this journey to find other businesses just like Death Wish Coffee, who put the customer at the center of everything, and we're gonna tell those stories because more than ever, those are the business stories that deserve to be told. Like, you don't feel like you're a customer. You feel like you're part of the family. And that's huge.
<laughs> oh, so all the feels going through me right now for so many different reasons. Uh, Nick, that's so obviously not, and I know we had a couple of uh, technical issues for some people and platforms. So I apologize for that, folks. We are piloting more than one thing here. Uh, so thanks for your patience. But uh, that is clearly not a talking head <laughs> interview show. Uh, you and I talked a lot about Chef's Table, um, Anthony Bourdain, my storytelling idol. And uh, I kept waiting for you to just pull one over on me to be like, no, just kidding. We're not going to do something like that. Are you kidding me? You're going to interview people over Zoom. Um, why go that extra mile or several miles, many, many miles to do something of, of this uh, style? Well, these companies represent something that's intangible. You know, it's, it's really difficult to put a finger on what makes them special unless you tell their story in the most authentic way possible. So I, I remember the show that inspired me most kind of leading up to this idea wasn't a Bourdain show, but it was one that not many people know. It's called Raw Craft. Yeah. Where he went and interviewed these people, these makers, uh, that, that made incredible items, whether it's like a snare drum or a guitar, uh, but just spent days with them understanding what went into their craft, right? And I wanted to tell those sorts of stories, but for the businesses and, and how they serve their customer and community uh, in, a much, in a much bigger way. And, and it just felt like the only medium was one in which we could really kind of put them at the front, uh, put them on a pedestal and just try to tell their story to the best of our ability. Yeah, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm learning a lot about these companies and the, and the mission behind this show, I'm also learning a lot about these types of projects. And one of the things that I learned is just how much uh, magical stuff happens when you didn't plan it, plan it out ahead of time. A lot of planning went into this show. You know, you have, you have to develop the premise, you have to develop the format, you try to document roughly what the story arc looks like in general. So there's like a style to each episode that's somewhat consistent. Um, you know, then the third part is is talent. So, you know, I'm okay, I'm gonna host my, what's the role here? We're gonna do voiceover after a little bit. Like we're inspired by those Bourdain type shows. Like there's a lot of stuff you plan to create a strategy, but then you go live on a shoot like this. And, you know, Jeff Ayers who hosts their podcast that you saw pretty heavily featured in this episode, he starts going, oh, you know what we should do? Let's let's show you this like uh, this showroom glass case full of these collectible mugs. And then he tells you this amazing story about why people collect their mugs. And then he goes to the mission of the business and he connects it so beautifully. And, you know, you should meet so-and-so down the street. And this happened in a couple of the future episodes that we're going to debut where people are like, have you talked to so-and-so in town? Because you really ought to. And so, like, we, we reserve what uh, Tyler, our, our, our producer, calls pickup days. Um, very common in production because there's all these things you don't plan and and the serendipity kind of like throwing the mission and belief behind the show at these people and saying what do you make of all that and then following up and digging for their specifics um, that really does only happen when you can sit with someone face to face which is kind of a sad realization given quarantine right now you know I, we started out this episode talking about the original coffee shop before Death Wish was born this coffee shop that Mike Brown was running into the ground that was sort of saved by creating that one product to sell through the shop. So here we are around tons of strangers in this very warm environment, very chilly outside, snowy day. And I'm talking to CJ and his daughter. And it's I'm like pouring a Death Wish coffee out for coffee shops right now. So there's just there's such a degree of intimacy and discovery and story that gets lost when you're trying to do it through through a screen. So it was a privilege to go live. And you absolutely know, like by way of producing so many podcasts and shows that it's really difficult to make that spontaneity happen, yeah. right? Uh, when you're when you're producing a podcast, sometimes it's just being there and interacting with people and just seeing where the conversation takes you, right? I mean, it's. Uh, I remember even after we filmed the Death Wish episode, we said, okay, we really want to schedule a couple days of the shoot for absolutely spontaneous conversation of filming, right? Yeah, and certain things get lost over uh, audio too. Like, what was that noise behind Nick just now? It was an adorable dog. That's what it was. <laughs> that was my dog, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it comes through on video. Um, what are the, some of the things that you felt like you learned from a story 
like Death Wishes. You know, given that Mountain Peak, given the mission behind this this stuff that we're doing together, what insights, traits of companies, you know, little tidbits did you pick up on in that story and in, in the production that we did? Well, it was so nice to feel as an entrepreneur validated to some extent, right? There, there's, I spent so much of my time. The reason this series is called Against the Grain, uh, or at least one of the reasons is I feel, I feel like as an entrepreneur, I've spent so much of my time just kind of pushing against what I understand as the status quo. And it's so inspiring and validating to a large extent to see other companies kind of living this, this way that I've been thinking for so long right? Uh, to do things like we said earlier, uh, to do marketing and branding that you can't write a check for. It's all creativity, right? It's all just trying to create a connection with your customers. And while you might have to write a check through the process, a lot of success comes down to being creative and yep. really putting your heart and soul into it. And I find that they do that over and over and over, right? Whether it's the comic book, or the Super Bowl commercial, or they're always investing in their customers through these incredibly creative and risky endeavors, just because that's who they are as a brand. And I found that to be quite inspiring and, and validating at the same yeah. time. There's different flavors. As, as I look across the episodes that I know are coming, there's different flavors of where these ideals come through. And you know, you could argue it's present in all the operations of all these companies, but the story we're telling might accentuate one thing or another, depending on the access that we had and the people we came into contact with or the way the story seems to develop and post. And in this one, it's more like marketing and product led than it is, you know, episode two is very customer service and community led. Uh, and the digital sense. Episode three is very community, like local community driven. Um, and so in this episode, when I think about their marketing, a phrase comes to mind that describes what these businesses do or how they see the role of marketing for their brands, um, which is that marketing for them is about participation, not promotion. You know, if you're not participating in the community, how do you hope to build anything that serves them? How do you hope to create a platform on which they can stand? You know, I think of companies that we admire, like in B2B tech, you know, I think of in Envision, which sells software for product designers. They've built a platform, yes, in the product sense, but also in the marketing sense. They want to elevate the role of the product designer, give them a, a seat at the table. They've observed for years how a lot of designers are treated as last mile, you know, make the button or the logo bigger or different kind of, you know, buttons that, that the team wants to hit. Oh, I wish this designer would just spit out the deliverable, right? No, they want to help people's careers help the philosophy. They want to help people design with ethics in mind for these tech products we use every day. Um, so they built this platform on which that idea and therefore the people that believe in those ideas can stand. Really hard to do that if you view marketing as a, an alert system about awareness, right? It's not, it's about affinity. It's about saying like, I care about you and this belief system and here's the proof and not just the slogan. Um, so that phrase came to mind with Death Wish. Marketing is about participation, um, not promotion. Uh, another thing I wrote down when I was going through that relates to this point, and then I'll, I'll leave this rant behind so you can comment, Nick. I always talk about a, a proof point to say that you are participating in the community is what I call the t-shirt test. Like, are you doing something about your brand? It doesn't have to be your company logo. It could be your podcast logo or a little phrase that appears everywhere. Sorry, I cut out there. Um, it could be a podcast logo, it could be a phrase on your podcast, but is there something about what you're building someone would wear proudly on a t-shirt? And Death Wish went, t-shirt? No, 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 no. Tattoos, my friend. Tattoos. Yeah. Permanence. We want permanence. Yes, forever. Well, and, and that's what's really inspiring about these businesses is con consumers have a good BS meter or detector when it comes to a company and whether they're being genuine, uh, whether they really stand for something beyond the profit, right? Whether they really do represent a purpose in their community and for their customers. And uh, it's it's just so inspiring when you do encounter these companies uh, that it's just, it's so clear and it's so authentic on their behalf that they want to leave the world better than they found it. And they're, they're engaging a particular audience and engaging those folks in a way that uh, makes them feel heard and seen and validated. It's just, it's such a good kind of warm, fuzzy feeling as an entrepreneur, like kind of having lived that to some extent, I'm, I'm just addicted to it. It's such right. a, it's such a validating way of going about a business 
uh, that I, I just want to see. I want to see a, another generation of entrepreneurs kind of take part and uh, get in there. Right. I'm seeing some questions come through. Jorge's adding them too. Um, so reminder to leave your questions in the chat about any parts of this, the strategy, the production of it, uh, the marketing of it, you name it, um, where we go from here. One of the comments that I want to uh, reply to here is that like how many people work at Death Wish? 60. And a lot of those work in the warehouse. 60 people. This is not a giant corporation here. Uh, so question from uh, one of the, I think maybe YouTube channel here. Looking back, what would you have done differently? Um, whew. <laughs> I mean, I saw that, I saw that uh, to camera moment. They call that spiking the camera when you look at the camera and you're not supposed to, but we did an intentional moment of me spiking the camera at the end where I was doing a little confessional to send us off before CJ's final quote. Um, what, yeah. what I would have done differently was maybe buy some cover up, take a nap or something. My daughter was three months old when I shot that. I looked like the walking dead in that last shot. So that's what I would have done differently. Uh, Nick, what, what would you have done differently with this episode? You know, I, I try not to think about it in those terms. We we knew that we were going into uh, an endeavor in which we were way out of our depth. And I'm inspired in those moments, just knowing that we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have little things that we wish we could have corrected along the way. But what we're putting out there is risky and authentic. And uh, in that regard, I wouldn't change a bit. Uh, but if we're able to fund another three episodes like we really want to do, uh, then I'm sure we do a bunch of things differently, right? But only because we kind of learned the hard way and we leaned into this with open hearts and open minds, just trying to explore good stories and tell good stories and be respectful to the companies that we worked with and doing so. And so uh, in, in, in many regards, like no real regrets, it's just, I hope we have the opportunity to do this again and uh, tell some more stories. And I'm sure we would we would take many learnings with us along the way. Right, I mean, I think people conflate creativity with doing something big or wildly different and original. I think it's far simpler. I think it's about practice. And I think creativity is just the interplay between repetition Every time, I'm leaving you hanging. Creativity is about you're right. <laughs> it's about cliffhangers. No, it's about repetition plus reinvention, right? So you do something, you learn, you improve, you do it a little bit differently the next time. So I, I'm with you, Nick. I think everything gets you to the point where you can do it different the next time. Um, you're going to see more customers featured in future episodes. You're going to see our premise and the articulation of that premise and the story be a little bit clearer and more crystallized. And that's just going from episode one to two to three. I mean, imagine if we did 30 of these things, we get better and better. Um, so I'm going to keep looking for questions here. But one of the questions I had for you, Nick, is where do we go from here? Like, like what's next for this, this project or this idea? You know, we want to continue to tell stories. And uh, we may not always tell them in this kind of level of uh, fidelity. But uh, we want to continue to contribute to this movement. As you said, we're not inventing this movement. We're not inventing this way of doing business or anything of the sort. We just want to help write the playbook. And so if we can if we can offer any content along those lines, uh, whether that's video, audio, written content, we just want to tell more stories. We want to see more companies like this celebrated. Right. I, mean, I already mentioned that uh, as an entrepreneur, I, I felt so validated and seen just by way of, of watching that death wish story. And I hope other entrepreneurs are going to have the same reaction. Uh, it's okay to take risks and, and make big bets as a business on something that you feel like your customers are just going to love. Your audience is going to resonate with in a special way. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to really give a gift to your customers. Marketing is and branding is to some extent. And so uh, I, I hope that we can just tell more of those stories because uh, it gives me the fuel to kind of get up every day uh, and, and continue to take risks in, in our business and try to challenge the status quo. And if we can, continue to do that with other folks, then then yeah, we just wanna create more and more of that content. For those who can stay past the hour, we've blocked an extra 30 just in case there were a lot of questions so we can stick around longer. I know we're approaching some people's time here. Another question we got in the chat, if you could feature any company or entrepreneur in future episodes, who would you choose and why? Um, Nick, I'll toss this to you. If you can give like one or two, that's great. I, I have a strange answer to this, which I, which I don't wanna use to derail your answer. So if you have any in mind, let me know. I have none in mind, but there's a purpose behind that. So you go first. Yeah, there's there's so there's so many. Like there's some of the OGs. Like I, I did mention 
Patagonia and uh, Ben and Jerry's. I think Ben and Jerry's would be a really interesting one. I, the Patagonia story, everyone knows pretty well by now. Uh, but the Ben and Jerry's story, I was just reading about Ben and Jerry the other day. They're still quite active in the company. And it's they're such a phenomenal duo and specifically just kind of how they've uh, taken an activist uh, stance as a company has been really striking uh, and uh, really interesting. Right. Especially in such, you know, like their their press release, their press release in response to the Black Lives Matter movement was extraordinary. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, I just thought they were they were they were absolutely leading the way an activist sort of uh, culture and company should lead, and they make fucking ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just thought it would be a really interesting story to tell, but. Uh, there's so many co companies. I mean, the one that inspired us probably most when we were starting this company was was Mailchimp. I always felt like they were so invested in their brand and their audience, and and they've gone way ahead of us, right? They've got Mailchimp Studios. They're making series like it feels like they're releasing a series once a month, once every few weeks, right? They're, yes. they're really investing in this sort of affinity content. But uh, I've been so inspired by Ben and, and everybody at that company and the way they've invested in their brand and their customers over the years. So I've got a very long list. Uh, believe me, we are we are not running out of companies to, nope. to talk with and, and to tell stories about anytime soon. That's I mean, that's it aligns with my personal beliefs outside of Help Scout. You know, when we do our podcast workshops, the first thing you hear us say, spoiler alert, is you're not here to learn how to make a podcast. You're here to learn how to make a difference. Right. What happens at the project where you'll do so is driven by audio. Um, so companies that are hellbent on making a difference and can articulate that, um, that's who we're open to profiling. There's a question, are you looking for more companies? Um, we're, we're not ready to go into pre-production, but we're absolutely looking for more story threads to, to pull on and, and research. Um, I wanna give my answer to why I have no exact companies in mind. I think what you do when you do a concept-led, difference-making show um, changes after the first few attempts, so the pilots. So we've kind of got our pilots under our belt and it was about the companies. Now I think we need to start asking critical questions. Well, what if you face pressures from an external stakeholder or investor to break, not necessarily bad, but break selfish, break profit over people, right? Um, what company can help us answer that? What about B2B tech? What about boring sounding industries? The first three episodes are all consumer facing and they all seem like they, they have the right uh, CEO on board. Like what if, what if leadership doesn't get it, but it's about the bottoms up team to leadership change? Like I, we have all these questions and eventually you start answering questions by asking them, looking into it, finding companies that way. And so I don't want to look at the companies and the logos that I know as a knee jerk reaction anymore, because now it's like these are crucial questions that if we're going to be successful, people will be asking to execute on this in their work. So we got to go answer that. Um, this means we could talk to scientists and psychologists and econo uh, economists. This means we can talk to academics, uh, entrepreneurs, giant companies, you name it. So I kind of want to reserve any bias there and be biased towards the problems and the questions that we need to start knocking down. Um, you know, the other way to look at this is, is maybe there's a book in here, right? And maybe yeah. you and I would co-write it or something, but to get to the book, you need your darlings, both for and against those big lead stories. You need the supporting examples. You need a diverse array of them. So you have representation across every set of uh, sense of that word. And then you need to start thinking about the methodology. Is there a methodology? Is there a framework that we can use to codify all of this? Um, all of that is built over time, over working it and reworking it and telling stories. So that's that's my answer to why yeah. I'm not thinking about companies quite yet. Well, and one of the hard, I mean, it kind of brings to mind the hardest thing about this series, which was getting yeses, right? Like we, we got a lot of no's from companies because it's like, wait a minute, you make customer service software and you're like doing a video series with this guy that's never done a video series before. Like, how can we trust our brand, you know, with you all? And uh, huge thanks to the three that did, but we got a lot of no's along the way. So there's still a, a long list of companies that I want to go back to and I want to show them this series. Yeah. I want to say, look, these are the stories we wanted to tell. This is why we want access. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to go back to them and get a few more yeses next time. Yeah. And I also think about, you know, I, I think about Patagonia being the example you cited, I think correctly so. What story is left to tell about them? You know, we kind of understand them. You're already thinking about them. It's exciting because it'll attract some super fans. Maybe that's a way we get more attention on the show. That's fine. Um, but like I said, it's not about awareness. It's about affinity. It's not about giving out answers that are already well wrought. It's about asking questions we genuinely don't know the answers to. And if Patagonia can help us 
address those, wonderful. Um, but you know, I think the the optics from the outside looking in, where we sit in the cheap seats, the companies that we're like definitely want to talk to, maybe we tap them in other partnership like ways and not feature them so heavily. Because also, by the way, it's easy to disassociate. Oh, I'm I'm not Patagonia. I'm not Mailchimp. Right. Right. I'm this company in this weird little niche. You're exactly who we want to execute on this stuff. So we need you to see yourself in the story. Yeah. How big is Naturalicious? Like that's a smaller company, right? Yeah. Episode two, which I is my favorite episode. I think the Help Scout team probably yeah. agrees with me. Um, yeah. Uh, incidentally, it involves the least amount of me, which maybe is the reason. Yeah. Uh, it does involve the least amount of me, but it is an incredible story. The Their team is three full-time staff. And I think five or six warehouse workers that they do through a program, which I don't want to reveal. It's a really awesome yeah. way to hire warehouse workers coming in that episode. Um, that'll be at the end of September when we debut that one. Um, so I asked that question like precisely because I love to tell the story of a of small business, right? Like that's, that's, you know, not even founded that long ago. Like they've, uh, they've just taken a different path and you would never otherwise hear their story that needs to be told, right? Like I'm totally with you. It's my favorite episode of the three uh, that, that, and, and we have an opportunity to tell that story. So it's not always about telling the familiar brand story, but maybe it's one that, that people wouldn't otherwise hear. Amen. So I'll give a quick housekeeping rundown as, as more questions come in. Um, again, we're going to stay through the half hour if people want to keep chatting, but for those who have to go know this, the first episode publicly debuts. So you got the sneak peek uh, you t uh, next week, August 18th. If you are not on the email list, it's helpscout.com slash ATG. That is where we're going to continue to do these behind the scenes things and other exclusives. Um, that's where you can engage most deeply, helpscout.com slash ATG. All the episodes will appear there and there's an option to subscribe. Um, if you're interested in the production elements specifically, the strategy, the planning, the pre-production, the production, the post, um, I will be doing with our production team some behind the scenes one week after each of the first three episodes. The way you get invited to that is to head over to my organization, marketingshowrunners.com. Just join the weekly email list. We're going to be sending it out over the coming few weeks to do a production breakdown, teardown behind the scenes, kind of clip by clip dissection, which should be really fun. Um, and obviously, a lot of you know this. Love, 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 live. Love, live. Uh, there's a reason I like documentaries better than live. <laughs> uh, last thing, Facebook. If you are on Facebook, you already know this, but there's a Facebook group for this movement that Help Scout is helping to run. Um, you can join that at any time to join the Against the Grain mission and get more exclusive there too. Um, that's it from us in terms of our agenda. Um, one last call for questions. If there's anything else that we don't get to now, feel free to tweet us. We will make sure we respond. Um, very active on Twitter or anywhere else you can reach us. Um, Jorge, I'm not seeing anything else, so I'm going to break. I'm going to break. <laughs> you really, really <laughs> Thank you all for coming to this live stream. The gods are telling us it is time. We have run out. They want to hear me stop speaking. On behalf of Nick Francis, CEO of Help Scout, and the whole Help Scout team and production team, thank you for supporting Against the Grain. But more importantly, thank you for contributing to this movement. Let's make sure there's a better business story. Let's build businesses that are better for all. Thank you so much for coming. And we'll see you soon. Bye.